501 Cast. Information you need from experts we trust. Hi, everyone, and welcome to 501 Cast by Nonprofit Resources. I'm Emily Bremen, and I'm an account manager for NPR. And today we're going to talk about maintaining a young workforce. I have with me Clint Shireman of Knopf Insulation, who will be presenting today's topic. Uh, Clint serves as an advisory board member for High Performance Insulation Professionals, which is one of NPR's longest standing clients. Um, Clint, you and I have been working together for just over two years now, and working with the Knopf team has really been a highlight of my career. And as much as I give you a hard time, I'm not just saying that because this is being recorded, but... <laughs> I actually enjoy working with you and Johnny and going to all the conferences and the workshops together. Uh, so thanks for sitting with me today and giving me a little bit of your expertise on today's topic. Um, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Uh, that is the nicest thing you've ever said to me. Um, I've always been interested in uh, different generations and uh, the experiences they had growing up. Um, but what, what made me actually start looking into this more seriously is uh, one time uh, my wife and I were driving somewhere and I said something about being a millennial and she told me that I wasn't. And then I said, well, I, I am and so are you. And she was outraged <laughs> that I would call her that. Uh, but we were born in 1989, which is right in the middle of the generation. So we can't deny it one way or the other. But it's just kind of interesting. We're, we're not alone. I mean, we've all seen the, the time cover uh, proposing that Generation X was the lost generation. As far back as Socrates, uh, there's, there's records of him trash talking youth. So this is something that interests me. Uh, I am by no means an expert, but I'm looking forward to talking more about it today with you. So, I do have a little bit more to add about Clint. Um, I think it's really important for today's conversation that everyone know about your successful pita pit delivery driving career back in college, um, but also this. I just want everyone to know about this and how much this photo means to me. <laughs> I trusted you. You're right. That looks like a guy who would uh, get his ear pierced in a car uh, because a pretty girl told him it was a good idea, if I had to guess. Did that happen? Uh, no. Okay. Never. Well, let's move on to why we're here to talk. Um, maintaining a young workforce. So let's start with defining a generation. What are the key influencers that define a generation? Generations are groups of people that uh, share similar points and experiences in history. Uh, so once you get outside of a certain set of years, you enter into a new generation. The years on the front or the back sometimes are, are uh, disputed. So the years I'll use today are general. I think that I took them from the Census Bureau. So generations that are still at work today, um, we'll start with uh, baby boomers. Uh, those are people who were born from 1945 to 1964. They were post-war babies that grew up to become radicals. Um, and this is also speaking in general senses. Uh, not all of these generalities uh, define every single person in the generation, but this is the overall view of uh, that group of people. Their uh, childhood and early adulthood were in uh, the golden age of capitalism. So a lot of them were able to chase the American dream and actually achieve it. Some big influencers on them were, were, would be the, uh, the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, the Cold War. They also actually saw people go to space and land on the moon. So uh, growing up, they had, uh, I don't know, a lot of hope and felt like anything was possible. After them comes Generation X, uh, 1965 to 1980. They were known as the latchkey kids. Uh, in the 70s, both parents started going to work. Traditionally, it's always been the father or male of the household 
goes to work, the mother would stay home. In the 70s, both parents started going to work. So these uh, kids would come home from school alone and spend the first few hours of their afternoon or evening alone, make themselves snacks. They'd start their homework, whatever the case was. They also came of age when the United States started to lose strength as a superpower. Uh, around uh, their early childhood, they found out that politicians actually lie. After them, raised by uh, younger boomers and older Gen Xers is Generation Y or Millennials, 1981 to 1996. Because of the latchkey kid scenario, uh, they actually tended to grow up overparented. Uh, the term helicopter parent applies to uh, Millennials because kids were home alone for longer periods of time, uh, they now, the, that, that group of children have become adults and are parenting kids uh, and made everything hyper-scheduled, created positive tolerance in homes, and asked their children for their opinion. Some major markers would be terrorist attacks of 9-11. I think we all remember where we were when, when that happened. Uh, the global recession and then and global connectedness. And uh, with that global connectedness, we've never been truly away, at least in our most of our working lives. Um, and because of that, uh, work-life balance is really important. We could work anywhere at any time um, for the most part. Um, and because of our connectedness and then also the recession, we want work-life balance now. We watched our parents and or friends uh, work really hard and uh, get laid off or lose retirement or or maybe even die young. So um, the idea that millennials won't work is false, but we also uh, want to be able to enjoy life now. Uh, the generation after us, uh, which is in high school and uh, college currently, um, some are entering into the, the older generate or older part of the generations entering into the workforce, but Generation Z. Uh, 1997 to, uh, this was harder to find an end year, but we'll say 2010-ish. This is the first full generation of digital natives. Um, so this group of people grew up completely immersed in technology, where uh, Emily, you and I probably can remember a time in our homes without internet. There's going to be a lot of carryover uh, from younger millennials to older Gen Z. A lot of the markers for this generation are still being defined, and it's a little fluid, but one, one big thing is um, within schools, they are starting to adopt universal design for learning. So what that means is if I am a teacher and I am uh, in a classroom with 30 students and I have a high achieving student and I have a student with a learning disability and I have a, uh, two students that, that don't speak English uh, or are learning English, uh, I don't just come up with one lesson for the day. I am now coming up with a lesson for the general class population, my high achieving student, my low achieving student, and the two students that are learning English. Um, the, the idea of any sort of sink or swim mentality uh, hasn't worked well in a long time and it will continue to uh, go away and be phased out with this younger generation. Is that something that the older generations definitely didn't have when they're in school? Because I just think about my parents talking about what school was like and I guess the term like hand-holding is used a lot nowadays. <laughs> So yeah, what your thoughts on that were? I think so. Uh, it, a lot of decisions in schools, I think, are made on uh, research, but in a lot of ways, they are still experiments to see how it will actually be uh, played out and work and affect uh, students. But nothing is done, uh, or at least nothing should be done, to try to hurt students uh, and their uh, ability to learn and grow. It is just vastly different now than it was when I was in high school. When I was in high school, it was vastly different than when my parents were in high school. So it is, it's, it's just always changing, and it always will. Um, so what are some of the most common misconceptions about the millennial generation? I know that something that's said a lot is that we're lazy, um, that we don't want to work, which is kind of something you'd said before, but uh, just thinking about the age difference, you know, you're 31? 30. 30, okay. 
Yeah. And I'm 24 and the generation goes up to about 38. Is that right? Um, yeah. So I think a lot of people, when they say like, oh, those dang millennials are thinking that we're still in high school and college. And if I'm the absolute youngest of this generation, I was born in 1996. So um, I'm not in college anymore. <laughs> so what are some of those misconceptions? Well, it's uh, just a, a quick point to that too. It's interesting that with so much more technology and uh, media outlets and things like that, I can go and find uh, just about whatever news I want. So if I want to find out why young people suck, I can find lots of news sources to support that. Um, but it's interesting because when we were coming of age is when that really started to happen. And so the term millennial has now uh, just inadvertently been used to describe high schoolers. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, there was the whole Tide Pod challenge thing, and and millennials were so stupid for eating Tide Pods, but it was like 13 year olds doing it. It wasn't. It wasn't us. So uh, when I when I give this presentation, I have um, a slide that has a bunch of headlines on it that are. And it's just one of the you know many that I found that are things that millennials have killed. And so just a couple of, of funny ones are, uh, well done millennials, you've officially ruined handshakes for everyone. And if, if we didn't do it, then the last 60 days surely has done that. Promiscuous millennials are killing McDonald's. While I don't know what that means, I do have a friend that is responsible for the remodeling of a local Taco Bell. <laughs> so that might have some truth to it. I, I think guess. it's like your guys' age group, actually. You're the instigators. <laughs> uh, maybe so. Uh, and then uh, uh, another one, millennials aren't hypocrites. They just prefer to kill trees. Maybe, I guess. I don't, we're, we're buying more things online, so there's more boxes. I don't, I don't know what it means. But. Uh, and then misconceptions in the actual workplace um, is that uh, we won't do the grunt work or want managers uh, to do the do their job for them. And that's simply not true. Um, they chose to come to work for you too. They're excited. They want to they want to come in and immediately start making a difference. Um, so they have this flame and it's important to not extinguish it. But with that, uh, they will do almost anything you ask as long as they know how it will make a difference for the company and what the purpose is behind it. They grew up over-supervised, you know, their, their parents asked for their opinions. So because of that, they have a different relationship with authority. They would, they would much rather be coached and taught than just managed. And they, they still respect leadership, but they, they don't view it the same way as previous generations do. And as a easy example of that is, you know, they're not going to sit around and wait for some sort of imaginary tenure because management now is so much more accessible. If I wanted to, I could tweet the CEO of Delta right now or, you know, name any company and I can probably find who runs it and get in contact with them in five minutes. So because of all that, they're going to be less likely to be pushed in the corner and uh, wait for their term, turn to matter uh, within the business. And then another big misconception is that uh, money doesn't matter um, and all they want is purpose. And it is absolutely true that purpose and meaning in our work is very important, but money does matter. Uh, we still need to be able to afford to live. Inflation continues to rise uh, every year. College tuition has gone up over a thousand percent since the 1970s, above regular inflation. Uh, the only thing that comes close to college tuition with inflation rate is college textbooks, uh, <laughs> and then it's healthcare. So money does matter. Uh, you know, making a living is important, but money is just a threshold issue. That is what gets someone in the door, but it's not necessarily what what makes them stay. You or I could go anywhere and probably earn a living. What else keeps us at the company beyond just being able to uh, pay our rent or mortgage and buy food? I thought that, that I was special and different. <laughs> um, when, I, when I actually started applying for jobs after college or during college, uh, I was looking for things where I thought I could make a difference. And as it turns out, uh, I'm not special or different. <laughs> Um, everyone else kind of looks at and wants the same thing. Uh, and that is not just millennials, that's every generation. 
uh, you know, there's, there's really four things that any generation wants and they may shift uh, as, as they age and priorities change, but the, the four things are to have meaning, value, and purpose in their work. They wanna be able to utilize their strengths. They wanna be acknowledged for the work that they do, and they wanna be a part of something bigger than themselves. Uh, and that is everyone from uh, a baby boomer all the way down to Gen Z just entering the workforce. Well, I do think that your mom probably thinks that you're special. <laughs> um, for what it's worth, my mother was appalled at my junior yearbook photo. So, but it was funny, so I kept it. It fits your brand. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's talk about recruitment and attracting the talent you need to grow. What are some of the most successful ways an employer can engage in employee recruitment? We have uh, already talked about uh, technology and general connect connectedness uh, and how the generation coming behind us is the, the first full uh, generation of digital natives. I think we need to get one thing out of the way right now, and that is that we need to be uh, visible online, but we can't just be visible. We have to be interesting and user-friendly. And if we're not, then we, we might as well not even exist for younger generations. So we need to have a website or we need to have some sort of Facebook presence or Instagram, and it needs to be good. And I would, I would venture on the side of don't overthink it, make simple, compelling messaging um, for those spaces uh, and leave it at that. Uh, beyond that, millennials and Generation Z have been advertised to their entire lives. So targeted TV ads, YouTube ads, apps with ads, you name it. Um, so most companies think about how they will advertise uh, and attract customers, but, but now we also need to start thinking about how uh, we're going to advertise and attract employees um, because they are uh, internal customers. So one way to do that is to create the, the purpose of what you're doing uh, and tie it into everyday life. So to have a, a vision mission, and then your core values. Uh, the vision is where you see the company going. It's kind of a grandiose view. An example, um, Teach for America's vision is one day all children in this nation will have the opportunity to attain an excellent education. And we have the mission, which is the roadmap to get to that vision. So Patagonia's is Build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm, use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. So that's what they're doing every day to get to their vision. Uh, and then you have to have core values that you, you live by every day. Where I work, Kanoff Insulation, our core values are Menschlichkeit, partnership, commitment, and entrepreneurship. Menschlichkeit uh, is a German word because we're a German company that translates to the greater good. We, we've established kind of our internal brand. Uh, we have a website. We can start looking at uh, employee referrals. Uh, if we have a good employee, we'll ask them, you know, do you have a friend that might fit in here? Because winners tend to hang out with winners. Why we hang out, right? That's why we hang out. That's right. Losers also hang out with losers, though. So I don't know if. Uh, anyway. Um, Moving on. Yeah, but this, this, so this could also appeal to work-life balance. Uh, you get to have a friend at work, but you should also pay attention and take note of if you ask your employees, um, do you have a friend that might fit in here and they say no or they refuse to refer anyone, what does that tell you uh, about where they're working? And, and what can you change to try to make it a better space? Examine the culture, and if it's there by default, is it, a good culture? Uh, are you moving forward with your plans because of it uh, or does it need to change? And then aside from that, uh, teachers and counselors are a great resource. Uh, high schools or local colleges, um, if they're in your community, there's potential for co-op programs, volunteer hours. Two personal examples. In high school, my brother's machine trades teacher knew every machine shop in town and so he knew what which of his students would fit at each shop 
uh, on, a, on a personal level and had a really high placement rate after graduation um, because he was so connected. And not every community has a person like him, but, but they, they are out there and they do exist. Uh, and then for me, um, when I was in college, uh, some of my uh, nonprofit classes actually required so many volunteer hours uh, a semester. So you would have to go out and, and, you know, you could choose who you would want to work with through the semester. Uh, but then there was also uh, a couple of classes in particular, you were paired with a nonprofit and then you were given projects from that group to work on. Uh, so, so actually one of mine, uh, a big one was uh, revamping uh, a company's website. I, I wouldn't say rely on volunteers and free college labor, but uh, you know, those opportunities may exist if, if you have something like it close by. Um, and then the actual recruiting efforts in online job postings, you know, again, be visible online. Uh, if, if I see a post from someone and then I look them up and they don't have a website or it hasn't been updated since 2005, probably not as interested already. But people do spend more time applying for jobs that emotionally appeals to them. But when you when you start to create a, a a case for that emotional appeal of a job and the purpose that it has, you can't start overselling a crappy job. And if it if it is a crappy job, I would be upfront with it and and say it honestly, but also connect that crappy job back to uh, the vision and mission and core values of the organization and how that job in particular relates to it and you know how it helps save the planet. Right. If it's a crappy job, but it's rewarding, it's a little bit different than a crappy job for the sake of being a crappy job. Right. And um, just as an example, not that um, driving a forklift is a, a crappy job, but uh, Ray Anderson from Intertech Carpets has um, a really great culture and had some consultants come in to try to study and figure out what he has done to put that in place. And uh, there's a story that there was one consultant didn't believe everything he was saying and just thought he was he was kind of out there. And they were walking around the warehouse, you know, taking a break on from from their meetings or whatever and stopped a forklift driver and asked what what he was doing. And he said, well, you know, I'm saving the planet. And they said, no, really, what are you doing? And he said, I'm, you know, loading this carpet on this truck uh, in a time that keeps me safe and people in the warehouse safe. I'm using less fuel. This carpet, uh, you know, has less byproducts, X, Y, Z. I'm saving the planet. And he was a warehouse worker loading, loading a truck. So you can communicate that message from the top all the way through your entire organization. It's just a matter of how you do it. Uh, state your core values in the, in the job description. Uh, and then uh, say what you want in a candidate, and that's soft skills and things that can't be taught. Uh, and what that does is it tells the candidate whether or not they are a fit for the position in the company immediately. Um, so how can an employer determine if a candidate is the right fit after they've kind of gotten that pool? When I gave this presentation last, I had done interviews with uh, a handful of contractors to see what they do to recruit and retain new employees. Um, and there was an overwhelming sentiment that they would rather leave a position unfilled than pick the wrong candidate. And the reason for that is uh, because they knew they would leave uh, or they would drag other employees down with them and then more employees would leave. The average across all industry for turnover is one in six new hires leaves. And the, the average cost to replace that new hire is 90% of the salary to lost production, uh, you know, rewriting the job description, reposting it, trying to find someone uh, with your time or using a recruiter, whatever, whatever the case is. So the biggest determining factor beyond everything that's listed. You've, you've had your selection process. You have a pool now. Deloitte actually found that millennials rank their own personal values and morals highest when they make a decision at work. And company values actually rank fifth uh, <laughs> on that scale. So, uh, and that's behind the potential impact to customers and their own personal goals and things like that. So 
I would try to find employees that reflect those same core values so you know when they are making decisions at work uh, that they are inherently for the good of uh, the customer and uh, the company and the community. Yeah, so we went to a conference where they were talking about recruitment and um, the core values and how they utilize that to determine if a candidate was the right fit. Um, so one of the companies, what they said that they did was they wrote down their company's three core values, each one on a different card, but then on 20 other cards, they wrote core values that their company didn't line up with. And not necessarily that they're bad core values, it just wasn't their three main ones. So then any time that they were interviewing someone for their company, they would give them this deck of cards and they would tell them that when they come back for their interview, that they should have the three cards picked out that they identify with. And if they didn't pick any of the cards, any of the three that were the company's core values, they wouldn't get to interview and then if they picked one or two or all three then they would get to like the next step in the interview process um, and they found that that was a really good way of recruiting people that were the right fit. It's interesting also that in the the nonprofit world core values seem to be more important right um, and in the private world you know you create your mission and you have values and they go up on the wall in someone's office and no one knows what they are, but it's clearly very important. My values rank highest when I make a decision, no matter where I am, should mean that the values of the company come from the top down through the entire organization. Uh, and even things like, you know, other recruitment tools like the predictive index and things like that um, may have high placement rates and help lower turnover, but it's still asking you questions and examining things on a more personal level to find out how you operate to try to put you in a role. So even, you know, they don't say core values on it, but even still that plays into it to some degree. So once we've hired the right person or so we think it's the right person, what can we do to keep them around? In what ways are employee retainment tactics different for the millennial generation than those of the X generation? So when I started looking into this, I uh, thought back to my, uh, you know, my college psychology courses, uh, and, and there is this gentleman named uh, Abram Maslow who came up with this hierarchy of needs. The base of the hierarchy is, uh, you know, basic human needs, food, water shelter, security, and we talked about earlier uh, the need for pay. Um, pay satisfies all of those. Beyond that is um, personal and self-fulfillment needs of having a purpose and self-actualization and things like that. So we have to think about what happens beyond those uh, basic needs and how, the, how our companies can help fill those voids for our employees to, to try to get them to stay. From one generation to the next, uh, so from generation Y to generation X, there's not a terribly big difference of what they want out of work. You know, kind of the bottom line, if they don't have great managers uh, or if they don't know what's expected of them, if they aren't acknowledged for the work that they're doing or they're put in roles that don't suit them, then they're not going to stay. And that just you know, from one generation to the next, that is kind of what it is. Um, so what can employers do from the beginning to avoid that turnover? I know we've talked about it some, but can you elaborate? I think that you have to start on day one and start taking them seriously on day one. Um, like I, we mentioned earlier, they're excited to come in and start making a difference as quickly as they can. You know, it's, it's important to not extinguish their flame. So we need to take them seriously. Uh, but, but beyond that, uh, they need to be onboarded and brought up to speed. One statistic is that only 12% of employees think that their employers uh, do a good job with onboarding, which is absurdly low, especially when you, I mean, this is a, a example that's a little out there, but when you look at the army, they have this onboarding process called boot camp, and they have a, a washout rate that's so low it can't really be measured. I'm not saying 
run your new employees through mud and under barbed wire and but you know what what can you take that connects them so quickly to a mission and a group of people where you work that they don't want to leave but even if you have a great onboarding process you can't drop them into a demoralizing workplace uh, that goes back to culture um, hiring by core values and making sure that everyone actually fits uh, for the roles that are there uh, and, and everyone works together. Beyond that, it's, it's important to coach them. Just inherently, younger people have less life experience, uh, and because of that, they have fewer, fewer points of reference to compare the circumstances which they encounter every day. As managers, we need to invest time in them. Well, a few different studies have shown that a manager can have up to 20 direct reports and strong relationships with all of them. Beyond that, uh, you should establish boundaries that they can operate freely within. Remember, helicopter parents, everything's hyper-structured, uh, but they also do want freedom. So if you set the ground rules, uh, and those ground rules don't include your pet peeves, uh, and you set clear deadlines and goals, maybe we help break larger tasks into smaller, more manageable tasks, uh, and then give them power uh, and teach them how to manage themselves, they can operate freely within the boundaries that we have created for them. One other thing to help coach them is to actually help them keep score. Uh, in one of, the, one of the books I read, there's a funny story about a nuclear submarine commander who was out on a mission and uh, you know his daily staff meeting after a couple of weeks, like morale just plummeted and he asked one day like, what's wrong with everyone? And they, they said, you know, you don't, you don't acknowledge us for the work we do. And, and he said, well, no, it's like, you're supposed to do it. We're on a submarine, everyone has their own tasks. And, uh, and you know, what, what do you want me to do? Give you a gold star? And someone said, yes. And so like, as a joke, he started giving out little gold star stickers to people when they would do their jobs. And that actually like started to increase morale and created competition between all the people on the submarine and something absurd as that. Uh, actually worked. And then, uh, you know, one, one other thing you might consider doing is if you can't, maybe can't trust them to run with a project all the way, you might give them uh, the, the first impression of it. They're younger, they're new to industries or companies, they have different ideas, they don't look at things with the same lens, they, they're going to think about things differently uh, than we do, so let them be idea guys. Uh, but with that also, you, you shouldn't keep them in the dark with large issues. If there's a, a problem at the company uh, and you're not sure how to solve it and you don't want to worry your staff with it, um, your staff probably has the answer to help, help fix the problem. And then beyond that, give regular feedback. Only 12% of employees have had conversations with their managers about reaching their goals in the last six months. Uh, personally, I believe that the annual review shouldn't be. Um, if, if you are only talking with your employees once a year about what their goals are and what they're doing, that's not, they're not going to continue to work on that. And they're probably not going to continue to work for you as well. Um, what about companies that don't have any review process? Is that better or worse than an annual review? I, I don't know. Do you have, you don't have a standard review process, but are small informal reviews happening frequently? That I would say is much better than an annual review process. But if there is no feedback and no annual review, I don't think that's that will work. I don't think that's sustainable. I just put a lot of pressure uh, on managers to help coach their employees. Uh, one way to help alleviate some of that is to create some sort of mentorship program that will help create accountability within your company. It'll help train and educate employees uh, and could help cross-train employees and cross-train different generations on different things in the workplace. And it also helps foster communication across uh, the company. If we're having a mentor program for employees to learn, we might also think about actually developing our talent and having some sort of training process in place for employees to continue to grow and develop. You were at Pita Pit for three years throughout college, so what were they doing right besides you just needing a job uh, to keep you around? Yeah, I had a job. Uh, I got, I could afford rent. 
sometimes I got to eat there. When I, when I think back to working there through college in that, uh, in that phase of life, any company would be used to it that, that relies on uh, college workforce from one year to the next, people are gone. When I think about why I was there for three years, I don't remember a manager that wasn't a good manager, uh, which was really unique to food service. Everyone worked well together, but also uh, at one point, the, the owner of the company actually asked me what I wanted from the job as a delivery driver, took my reply seriously. Um, and that carried a lot of weight for me uh, and that is why I stayed for three years throughout college. When you think about the review process and the annual reviews, it's important for them to be asking you for your feedback, not necessarily for them just to tell you what you're doing, good or wrong, but to give you feedback and for you to give them feedback. Yeah, it's, it's really important. If you are doing a review uh, and you ask for someone's feedback at any point, you should, you should take it seriously. You know, we're all people and you have to think about how you would feel if, if I asked your opinion and then I just instantly made fun of it. Uh, you don't have to think about that because that's what we do already. But um, as far as an employer and employee relationship, that, that's really important. We have to take employees seriously and hear what they say. So let's talk about why a company should hire a younger generation and what those benefits could be. Um, so what can a candidate from the millennial or Z generations bring to the table that makes them a contender against someone with more experience? The easy one to point at would be, you know, an increased literacy in technology. Um, so if you have uh, a lagging social media presence, um, someone from a younger generation might be able to come in and help um, bolster that. Kind of the common theme throughout this is that millennials and Generation Z, while they have different generational markers, who they are and what they want out of uh, the workplace and the job isn't any different than other generations. There's not any one thing that, that uh, a younger person could bring over an older person. The, the main thing to keep in mind is to hire the right person for the role and the company. Um, so what about there's kind of a gap in the millennial generation, you know, like I'm the youngest of this generation and then it kind of spans to people who are nearing 40. So what about that gap? When you say that we all want the same things and we're all in these different stages, millennials too, like we're all in very different stages, even though we're in the same generation. The, you know, the, the world continues to change and it seems like it's changing more and more rapidly. In our generation is when technology and those changes really started to pick up. I don't know. There is a theory out there that uh, as technology continues to advance and those advancements happen faster and faster, uh, that we will get smaller sets of generations and then eventually the generations will go away. But to your point, I mean, I have, uh, I've got a good friend who is uh, the oldest in this generation, and he was in college when uh, the 9-11 attacks happened. I was in middle school, uh, and you were in first grade. First grade. So there's, there's big differences, right? I mean, I think he had a computer in his dorm room is what he, what we've talked about. Uh, you and I have talked about this, uh, where I, where I graduated from high school, we had, uh, 2,300 students. Uh, and the year I graduated, we had two computer labs, uh, around 50 computers for all of those kids. Mm -hmm. And when you graduated, you had your own personal laptop supplied by the school, right? Right. Everyone from, I think it was the ninth grade until senior year, we all had our own laptops. And then I think now they maybe even give them to the junior high students get their own. Yeah. So I, I don't know. There, there is a big span between the beginning of a generation and the end of it. Uh, and there's, there's carryover from one to the other. And, uh, you know, like I said earlier, not any one uh, generality of generation applies to every per person. You know, you, you can't see someone's age and automatically uh, exclude them from uh, the hiring process or what you want uh, in your company. Um, everyone's different and everyone's going to work differently for you. And it's really important to find the right person uh, 
uh, for the role. All right. Well, I think that concludes all the questions that I had for you today. Thanks again for joining me and giving us a little bit about your expertise. Even though you're not an expert, I probably one of the smartest people I know. So I appreciate you taking time with me today. Is there anything that you want to close with? Yeah, you should get out more. <laughs> uh, I, I, I want to say thanks. Um, I do not currently work in the nonprofit world, but I did uh, study in college and I think have a little bit more of a heart for that, or maybe maybe more of a mindset than I do for the private world. But I'm happy happy to to be here uh, with you and uh, and and try to help out this group uh, as much as I can. You know, we've talked about it uh, this entire time, but you know, everyone's different, and uh, and I think we should just be nice to each other. <laughs> Not you and I. <laughs> but. <laughs> Too similar. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you again for taking time today. And then for anybody watching, if you have questions about this webinar, this video, uh, you can give us an email at info at nonprofitresources.us or visit us on our website.